So this story is all about a cyber attack on a bank where a nation state hacker group was able to steal almost a billion dollars. And in fact, they got away with close to a hundred million. The victim was the Bangladesh bank and the perpetrators, at least according to this bad boy, was North Korea. But I guess let me first explain what this is all about. This is a US federal indictment, which is an official document where somebody is formally charged with a crime. In this case, the crime has supposedly been committed by this guy, Park Jin Hyuk. And I'll be honest, I could really recommend reading this. If you were to ask me what book you should read if you want to break into cybersecurity, then read this. This whole document reads like a movie script, but in fact, it's very, very real. The indictment is brilliantly written. It talks about the infrastructure that this criminal group have used, attacks that they've carried out, the victims, forensic analysis, malware analysis, and also about how the FBI identified those involved using threat intelligence techniques as well. It also links some super serious cyber attacks together as well. The attack on Sony Pictures, Wanna Cry, remember that little ransomware incident that basically shook the internet a few years ago, and also the attack that we're gonna talk about today, which is the Bangladesh Bank. I got hold of the malware that was used in this attack. I wanted to share with you the inner workings of it, peel back some of the layers, show you how they use some real clever techniques to commit this audacious crime. Could, could you imagine like sitting at your computer, writing some code that's gonna automatically steal a billion dollars from a bank? Like just imagine sitting there writing the computer instructions, the code, knowing what this code is gonna be used for. It's, it's almost unbelievable. We use a term within cybersecurity called indicator of compromise, often shortened to IOC. This is a phrase used to describe the signs of a malware infection. If you were to see certain attributes of malware in your log files, then that would be an indicator that you've been compromised and you should clean up and investigate further. When we analyze malware, our goal is to extract as many indicators of compromise as possible so we can hunt for infections, help others find similar malware campaigns, and IOCs often take the forms of URLs or IP addresses that malware communicates with, files that are written by the malware or process names that are created, all that kind of good stuff. It takes time to work out what's going on with malware. It takes brain power to figure things out, reverse engineer code, understand what functions do, what certain instructions mean, what API calls do what, etc. And adversaries, they don't make it easy. Of course they don't, why would they? So sometimes your analysis may well be painful, annoying, tedious, all that kind of hard brain power stuff. But in the end, you know what? If you go far enough down the rabbit hole, you know you'll eventually find your way out and find some light at the end of that tunnel. So keep going, keep diving in with your analysis. But before we get going, with this malware, let's just remind ourselves about the story of the Bangladesh bank heist. So in February 2016, Bangladesh Bank, they fell victim to an attack against their computers connected to the SWIFT payment system. Now SWIFT is a mechanism that banks use to transfer money between each other. And there was no compromise of SWIFT itself, but rather here the attackers were able to generate requests within SWIFT from inside the Bangladesh Bank. Those requests told the Federal Reserve in New York, where Bangladesh Bank keeps its own money, to transfer funds to a accounts in Philippines and also Sri Lanka. One of the reasons why the rest of the transfers that would have totaled a billion dollars, why they failed was due to the fact that the street address of the receiving bank in the Philippines contained the word Jupiter. Now Jupiter was also the name of an oil tanker and a shipping company that was under US sanctions against Iran. So it was on a list of sanctions. And so when this payment went through, it hit a red flag in the New York Fed because it contained the word Jupiter because of this sanctions list and therefore got flagged. So a little bit of bad luck there on the adversary's part and it's probably something they couldn't have foreseen in the attack. The adversaries, they used spear phishing emails to target Bangladesh bank employees. Now, they used resume themed 
emails that included a link to download a resume of a potential candidate for employment. They even sent some employees messages on LinkedIn, which is quite an interesting technique because that kind of message doesn't go through standard email filtering security controls. And it's actually a tactic that's still quite successful today as well. FBI analysis shows that at least three employees clicked the link and opened the file. And this first attack actually occurred almost a year before the billion dollar attack took place. So once they were in the network, it seemed pretty easy for them to move around and find the Swift systems that they were looking for. And what's also interesting as well, within the document, you'll find that the bad guys clearly have been busy. There's some forensic evidence that shows once they'd found the Swift terminals in question, they tried to log into it and they used some usernames and password from a different bank that was nothing to do with Bangladesh Bank. This was related to the Southern American Currency Exchange who were also targeted with some malware, but this was completely separate. So it seems like they, for a short period of time, managed to confuse themselves as to which victim they were dealing with and left some traces of that malware behind, therefore connecting those two campaigns together. But once they'd found the Swift terminals, they deployed this custom written malware, which we're gonna take a look at today to execute these phony payment requests. We're going to take a look at how we can extract as many key indicators of compromise as possible out of this malware. And we're going to see what it does when we run it in our lab with our monitoring tools and all of that kind of stuff around it as well. So let's get going. So what's interesting about this malware is when you run it for the first time in a lab, nothing actually happens. That's because this malware is designed specifically to run within a Swift environment. It's looking for particular folder structures to exist and also for particular programs to be present on the computer in order to execute its attack. And this makes sense, right? Because why would you wanna infect the system and launch an attack on a Swift payment terminal if you weren't actually connected to one? So how do we analyze malware that will only run in a certain environment? Well, we can mimic that environment. Of course, we could recreate those conditions. We could overcome the checks that the malware is making, or we could statically analyze the code to see what it would do without actually running it. And of course, we can try a combination of all those methods as well, which is oftentimes what we do in malware analysis. Here, what I noticed first about this malware is that it's not actually obfuscated in any real way. Malware authors often like to protect their code from static analysis and also from antivirus engines by hiding plain text strings and function names and all that kind of stuff, all the stuff that it uses by using what's known as a packer. And you can think of a packer as kind of like a zip file that compresses data into some weird format that makes the code smaller, but it also makes it difficult to read as well until you inflate it back up again. So it's easy to poke around the plain text of the malware and see some of the commands that it's gonna run on the underlying Swift database, for example. There are many SQL instructions here and some delete commands as well, which is indicative of the malware having the ability to tidy up after itself and remove records of transactions that it creates. The malware is deployed with an encrypted config file though. And I found this interesting given the main executable wasn't actually protected, but the configuration file for the malware itself was in fact encrypted. And through inspecting the malware code, there are some indications that the algorithm used to protect this config file is RC4. And you can see that from these two markers in what's known as a key scheduling algorithm or a KSA, which is part of an RC4 routine. So assuming that to be the case, it is possible to find where the malware is storing the encryption key and use that to manually decode the config file ourselves. And we can see the contents here in Cyberchef. There are lots of numbers in the plain text code here. These translate to transaction numbers that the malware is interested in. Presumably these relate to the false payments that will be made. And also there's a nice IOC, an indicator of compromise at the bottom here, which is the IP address that the malware eventually communicates back to, which belongs to the adversary. Also the malware enumerates the running processes of the victim device. It's specifically looking for a particular module to be loaded within the process. That's liboradb.dll, which is specific to this Swift platform. And a DLL is a library, a dynamically linked library to be exact, which a program can load at runtime and use the functions within, which saves the developer having to write those functions themselves. And in this case, the Swift platform uses functions within liboradb.dll to validate requests to the platform. And the malware actually overwrites the code 
code within this DLL located in the memory space of the Swift process with two bytes, OX90, OX90. So 9090, these bytes are machine instructions for what's known as a NOOP or NOP. And a NOOP is an instruction for the CPU to simply do nothing. The CPU will see a NOOP and it will simply skip over that line of code without performing any additional instructions. What the malware was overwriting though was a conditional statement, a decision tree that Swift was making. Do I accept this request or do I reject it? And rather than perform that request, the adversaries just blanked out the two bytes 7504 that would perform this conditional check. There was also a great blog post, which I'll link to below from BAE Systems called Two Bytes to 951 Million. Should have called it Two Bytes to a Billion, which explains this in some more details and is worth your time reading. So just imagine though that this whole attack theft of a billion dollars comes down to just two bytes 16 ones and zeros to make a decision as to whether or not to accept the request or not this is mind-blowingly simple but also such a powerful attack there's lots more with this malware that we could ultimately go down the rabbit hole with to be honest if you're interested in this space and want to play around i can definitely advise you set up a malware lab get hold of this malware and test out your skills use it as a practice playground it's a really interesting piece of malware to examine play around with it and it will help you understand the key principles of malware analysis and just what it takes to steal a billion dollars from a bank. I mentioned earlier that a key to this attack succeeding was the adversary sending spear phishing emails to employees of the bank and several of them clicked the link which furthered the attack. Phishing is a huge problem and so are passwords. You don't even have to get fish nowadays to have your passwords compromised. Oftentimes adversaries will break into systems and steal credential data and many times people use the same passwords across many different systems and accounts because remembering loads of passwords is pretty difficult. Password managers can definitely help you, but also so can these. This is a hardware security token that uses the latest technology to protect you against compromise. I use this to protect my Gmail accounts. If anyone tries to log in using my username and password, if they happen to get it, then they'll also need this to get in as well. I'm the one holding the key. It's protected with my fingerprint as well. It's super secure and it will give you peace of mind protection. These products were kindly provided to me by Fatian, who are the leaders in this space. I encourage you to check out their online store, which will be linked below. And as a bonus, you can get 20% off using the code Colin-20 at the checkout. Hope you enjoyed this video. I want to thank all of my followers here on YouTube and also on Twitter. You can follow me at CyberCDH and I'll see you all next time.